Um, <clears throat> it has been a, as, uh, as Pete was saying, the weather this week has been a bit brilliant. And then another extreme, isn't it? You kind of like, we've had sunshine, we've had clear days, and then we've had, you know, a bit of fog and mist and all sorts. So uh, it does start to feel, or it's starting to feel like winter. Is that your, your take on it? It's starting to feel like I need to take a mortgage out to pay for the winter bill that is coming my way if I want to put my radiators on, that's what it's starting to feel like. So um, as we um, prepare to pray, um, we, um, we've got loads of needs, obviously people that are ill, people that need God's touch, and we've got um, other needs on top of that, people that need God's intervention, uh, and then we've also got a nation that needs a lot of prayer as well. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot to pray for. Before we do that, one of my uh, kind of prayers that I always pray with God is like, you know, I'll look for, can I have an opportunity to share faith? And, uh, and so this week I, uh, I had a, a pastor's meeting on Wednesday, which was really, really good, really helpful. And then on Thursday I did a, a day's training where I trained people over Teams, over video cameras, how to do little engineering activities with kids. And at the end of that, we have a little, like, review. How did it go? Did it, all the teachers manage to complete? Blah, 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 blah. And within that office environment, if you can imagine lots of desks, etc., they, you know, I'm, I'm kind of not quiet, but I don't advertise the fact that I'm a minister, although some people do know. And uh, this week, I was sat there chatting away at the... Uh, at the desk, you know, giving some feedback about how this training had gone. And, you know, you, you know, you're hoping for a conversation that's deep and meaningful, where you can show your faith is genuine and God's done something in your life. And there's a new person that started at the work, and, um, and she's super friendly, you know, like she doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't smile like, like that. She goes, everything's, you know, everything's full on enthusiasm which is great. I love it. Anyway, bless her. She found out that I'm, I'm a, a minister, a pastor, and she has a big, not big, about the same size as that, pink Bible on her desk. Okay? So I'm chatting away in the middle of this office and, you know, giving some feedback, you know, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is there an opportunity to share faith? And she, across the office, goes, and I'm like, <laughs> I always feel like not enthusiastic enough for her when I wave back. I go, all right, yeah. She goes, I didn't know you were a pastor. And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't advertise the fact. And she went, and she picks up a pink Bible. And this is in the office from behind one of these, like, you know, you've got all these desks and you've got like a little mini screen. And she went, oh, oh, oh. across the office and I'm like what, what I didn't I'm just like looking at her going what's that all about <laughs> and she just thought that she was being like you know super enthusiastic about Christianity and I'm just like stood there with my eyes like about this big going what the heck are you doing People think Christianity is weird enough without people doing that in public. Honestly, I'm like, Lord, you've got a sense of humor. God's got a sense of humor. And, you know, I didn't, I just, and then the office went quiet. And she went, sorry? No, no, everyone just went, someone's just like looking at her, like, what's she doing? I'm looking at her going, what are you doing that for? And then I, can't, I think I just changed the subject. Oh, lovely weather we're having. Anyway, there you go. So this morning, we want to pray uh, for, we're going to keep um, Neil's wife, Karen, in prayer. She's got um, lots of stuff to, that needs to take place before she gets over to Southport. So we're going to pray that that gets sorted out uh, and she gets settled over there. We'll keep Enid in prayer, Anne and Bill, Harry, keep Harry in prayer as well. And we're also um, going to pray for, um, Paul, Paul Walker just asked for God's hand upon him there and got him to intervene. 
There are other people with other needs. I know there's lots of needs this morning. Uh, and as I always say, if you haven't sort of let that need be known, you want to keep that between you and God, that's fine. But understand one thing, that our God, as we've just sung, he loves us and he wants to intervene on our behalf. That's, that's how good he is. So if you'd stand with me this morning and we will pray and then we'll mingle and then we'll get into God's word. Father, your word and your people and your presence are all powerful, Father. And we look to you, not only as our refuge, but as our provider. Not only as our provider, but as our protector. Not only as our protector, but one who goes before us, Lord. And we have needs this morning, and as we pray and intercede and seek you, Father, we do ask that you move on these lives, move on situations that, that, that you know what to do, Father. We don't know, so we, don't, we can't come to you with the right words, but we do come to you with the situation and say, we bring it before your throne of grace. Lord, that you would work a work and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While you stood up, go around and say hello to people. If you need a coffee, go and grab one. Then we're going to start the preach in a few minutes' time. For those of you at home, you missed a synchronized sitting down. Uh, Brian and Peter. Look like they've been practicing that one in front of the mirror, actually, to be honest. Okay, just very quickly, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 7, which is page 489 in the Bibles, the hardback blue Bibles, Nehemiah chapter 7. And through this month of November, nearly through it all, we've just been looking at different bits and pieces before we get to December, and we're going to look at, obviously, the Christmas story. Um, next week, uh, we've got two people coming to speak to us. Woo! The excitement is quite palpable. I, I'm, uh, I'm feeling it. Um, one is a lady who runs Silver Cord. So we have uh, Barbara Sagar who um, helps out with Silver Cord, and that is a befriending ministry. And uh, Sue Clark is not here as well. She is going to be trained up to be uh, part of that, that, that same ministry. And um, so the lady that runs it, I'm, I'm talking, so I remember her name. Debs, that's the girl, yeah, Debs. He used Fiddler is a maiden name. She's now got painter, something like that. Anyway, she will come. She's going to give us a quick um, sort of pitch about what they're going to be doing over Christmas in, in terms of that ministry and looking at um, whether we can align ourselves with that and help out. Uh, and then after that, we've got Mark. I've asked Mark to come and preach us, Mark Yearden. Not heard from him for a while, and he's, 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 he's up for coming. So... So, two, yeah, it's all going to be different next week. There you go. Someone else talking to you. Aren't you blessed? Yes, you are. Amen. Let's look at the, uh, the website, if you can. So, on our website, we've got a uh, statement, which we call the vision statement. Okay. Our vision, if you just, and the bit that we want is that bit there. So, it says, we believe all people matter to God. We want to create a just and loving community. We want to seek the good of the town for all people through a gospel movement that brings personal conversion and community formation. So the bit I want to look at is that first bit. We believe all people matter to God. Thanks, Jake. So if we look down and get your Bible open to Nehemiah chapter 7, and the verse we'll read in a second is verse 6. Okay? Now, it is no surprise, I think, that most people feel or want to matter. It shows that the single biggest question that young people want answering is how can my life matter or how can I make a difference? And, and we've seen this evidence through movements in the past. Just a few years ago, there was a movement called Black Lives Matter. So the question of people mattering seems to resonate with our society, and it resonates with the gospel, with God's word. Some people have lived lives that appear to matter more than most. So some people, thinking of great leaders like Nelson Mandela, Winston Churchill, or William Wilberforce, and at the end of their lives, they've had big old statues erected, put up, and it's kind of like, well, because they've got a statue in honor of their name, 
Does that mean that our lives, if we don't get that, have not mattered? Now, there's a famous king in the Bible, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he famously went one further than everybody else, and he built a statue of himself that was absolutely massive, and then he made everyone bow down to it. And the three young Jewish men who refused to do so now are in a famous story within the Bible where God miraculously rescued them in the book of Daniel. And yet the book is named not after the king, but after the humble man who served the king and served the true king of kings, that man Daniel. So it seems to be the eternal question that's gone through the ages, will my life matter? Will it count for something? How important do you feel? And to answer that question, I want to look at Nehemiah chapter 7. Okay, so Nehemiah chapter 7, and we're going to look at just verse 6. And as is the case, when I look at text now, that's a bit small. It's got to take me time. There we go. These are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of the exiles from Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and are taken, sorry, who are taken Nebuchadnezzar, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, are taken captive. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramia, Nahamania, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpereth, Bigvei, Nehum, and Barnar. Aren't you glad you're not reading that bit of scripture? Then it gives you a list of all these names. Okay? Now, as we read this verse of the chapter, it's one of them chapters that you kind of read it, if it's your devotional read for the day, and you're reading that, and you just think, why don't they just pick call people John and Jim and Al and Bill and Nick and Mike and Mick and short names that are easy? But the reality is that they're there for a reason. And the thing about this list is the same list is repeated in Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter 2. So why would God put a list of long, unpronounceable names in the Bible, not only once, but twice? And what we need to understand here is how this book is put together and how this book flows before we can get an understanding about the list. The story in this book of Nehemiah is a story of a man who had a, bit, a vision to build a wall for God. The wall was not any wall, but it was the wall of Jerusalem, the surrounding wall of Jerusalem. And if you're a pastor or a leader, the symbolism there is powerful. You know, as a pastor or a leader, you want to build up walls, foundational walls, spiritual walls within your church. You want to build those people whose foundation is Jesus, a spiritual building. And... Um, and by building people up in their faith and by teaching and by preaching and encouraging, you want people to grow in faith. And we do see that. By evangelizing and introducing people to Jesus. And so when we say we believe that all people matter to God, as is in our vision statement, then there must be evidence of that. And one of the proofs is that we are living are we living these words are these words true in us and so as you, if you've been here any time and you've listened to preach and teach you know you've been in our life groups and you've you've listened to what's been said in those life groups that is one evidence that people matter why do we say that because we we want people to understand god's word to grow in grace and faith and therefore to come to what we call full maturity Full maturity in the faith. That's an evidence that we think people matter. A second evidence would be the impression people get when they come to church. I've had friends that come to this church. They've visited, they've sat down, they've talked to people, and they say they felt welcomed and loved, and they, feel, they felt included. And all that would add up to another way of saying, we believe people matter, we're inclusive, we we, we love people. And even when people turn up and, you know, they can be a little bit awkward. Generally, we love them anyway and, and, and put up with them. Why? Because people do matter. They're God's people. 
God's creation. But at the same time, you, you know, you look at your, your church, you look at your building, and you say, we want to improve it. You know, we want it to look neater at the front. We're working on that at the moment. We want, uh, I want this, all this stuff here, all the projector, I want it out of the way so it's just a nice, clean space. There's loads of little things that we want to do that could make the church look a little bit more presentable, and we're working on those things. Why? Because we want to present well. We want uh, people to, you know, look and see all the good that we're doing, and also we want people, therefore, to feel this can be their home. So we believe people matter to God, and therefore, if we believe that, we look for opportunities to share the gospel with them. And for them to make a decision, to serve Jesus. That's my heart. My heart is to see people saved. And so as we enter the Christmas season, we want to make it known what is the reason for that season. And we're going to have a choir that goes out and sings. And, you know, just very, very quickly, you might think, well, I haven't got a singing voice, um, and therefore I don't think I'm able. The, the bar is low. Don't worry. Okay? If you are breathing, you're in. It's that low. Okay? That's it. You know what I mean? That, that's all, it's not, nothing else. Not even bothered about how you look. You know what I mean? You know, if you turn up in your PJs, we still take you. you know? <laughs> now, as we look at the scripture, the commentators agree that the chapter that we looked at is a hinge or a pivot in this story of God's people. Um, chapters 1 to 6 describes the restoration of the wall of Jerusalem. Chapters 8 to 13 tell us about the restoration of the people. Chapter 7, therefore, begins with three verses describing the precautions that Nehemiah took to guard the newly walled city from attack. He wanted his work to be protected. The Bible talks about evangelism as a sower going to sow. You heard that story in the parable, a sower goes to sow. And he sows seed, and some seed falls on good soil, and some seed falls by the wayside, and some seed falls, and then the ravens come along and take the seed away. And in a sense... That is what Nehemiah's doing here. He's looking at what he's built and he's saying, I don't want anyone to destroy or nick or, you know, or disseminate what I've started. And sometimes I feel as a, as, as, as a pastor and as a, a leader of a church, there are times when you see God doing something and I do feel that the ravens come along. The ravens come along. Distractions come along. And people who are focused and all they want to do is, is do something for God, suddenly they're not as focused. And that's something I think we can pray about, which we will do after this service. And so as we look at this chapter, verses 4 to 73 looks towards the reforms of the second half of the book showing how Nehemiah went about repopulating his city so that it would become a, a center for national and spiritual life. And in a sense, that's what I, my heart is for our church. It'd be a center. It'd be a place where people can plug in, a place for the community. We used to have a coffee morning, and it's still in my heart to get some sort of community cafe off the ground. It's still there. I don't know how we're going to do it, but God's put it in my heart, so it will happen at some point. Now, as we start this chapter this is what it says at the beginning of the chapter. It says, After the wall had been rebuilt, I set the doors in place. The gatekeepers, the musicians, the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah. Again, John and Jim would have been better for me, but there you go. The commander of the citadel, because he's a man of integrity and he feared God more than most people. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem not to be opened until the the sun is hot while the gatekeepers are still on duty. Have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their post and some near their own houses. First thing Nehemiah did was he looked around and he got help. 
He looked around and he said, who can I put in charge of certain things to do these things that God's given me in my heart? And he appointed his, one I think is his blood brother, and the other guy was a man of good reputation. And he appointed um, as a civil leader of Jerusalem, Hananiah. Sorry, Hane, Hanani, Hananiah, he appointed as a military leader. Now, he gives them these instructions, and he wants his instructions to be carried out. And his instructions are, do not open the city until the sun is hot. Bolt them, stand them, stand guard when they're shut. Also, appoint guards from the residents. So he's telling them, you're going to have people that you need to delegate to. I'm delegating to you, and this is what I want doing. And they went and did that. And it's the same in church. We need structure. We need organization. We need people to do things. And um, there are plenty of people that already do a lot. And for what you do, I thank you. It's a blessing. It really is. But like I said, there are other initiatives. And for that to happen, God's going to have to bring some people. Now, what that looked like and how we achieve that, I don't know at the moment. But God's put it in my heart. So, to achieve the vision that God had put in Nehemiah's heart, he got and enlisted the help of others. And from getting help, he then looked for certain qualities. And these qualities can now be framed. Sorry, the qualities that we're now look at, you can put under that title, if you want your life to matter. So the first one he did, he looked at, was faithfulness. Now, this word faithfulness um, was a description of one of the two guys there. Hananiah was a man you could depend on to get things done. Getting things done in today's world is hard work. We live in a bureaucratic nightmare of a world. If you want to get anything done, you have to tick so many boxes, it is ridiculous. Uh, we were watching, I don't know whether you've watched this, but on uh, Amazon Prime, you've got uh, Clarkson's Farm. You ever seen that? And it's basically um, Clarkson, instead of doing cars, he's now doing farms. And what he wants to do is he wants to, he started this little shop and it became massively popular. So he wanted to enlarge the shop to employ more people, get, make jobs, create, create jobs. And to do that, he needed a bigger car park. There were 14 different agencies he had to go through to try and get car park planning permission. And at the end of going through all them 14 different agencies, they said no. And life's like that at the moment. It feels that if you want to do anything, you want to get anything off the ground, you've got to get through this hoop and that hoop and do this and do that and da 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 da, da and then dance on one leg and da, da. and then maybe you'll get a yes. But if God's put the vision in the heart, it will happen. And so we keep going. If God's put the vision in the heart, okay? So faithfulness was one of the qualities and it's a quality that is difficult to find nowadays in our society. Faithful people. Uh, my brother runs an engineering firm, and he says trying to recruit apprentices who can earn good money uh, in the 20s, it's like pulling teeth. These people don't want work anymore. It's, you know, people come in, and the work's not the cleanest work in the world, but it's well-paid work. And if they stick at it, they could be earning, I think it's around about 35, 38,000 pounds a year, and they are in the 20s, mid-20s. I mean, that, I'm like, that's, that's great. Can you get people to do that? Can you? Faithfulness seems to be a forgotten quality. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said this, the greatest ability is dependability. Depending on people to come in, and I know that there are people that we can depend on, and praise God for that, 
And we just need God to bring some more in so, so we can depend on them as well. Now, the purpose of our vision statement is so that we don't drift, we don't move, we remain focused on what God wants us to do. And so not everyone's called to be a, a Nehemiah, to build you know, a grand project. Not everyone's called to be a pastor. But there are characteristics you can have in your life if you want to see God use you for his purposes. And characteristic number one is recognize and define the responsibilities God gives you. I was talking yesterday to a friend of mine, and he, uh, he says that he, he comes from um, an African background, Nigerian African background. So the expectation in, the, in, in Christian families is that if you are educate, get an education, that's point number one, get a degree, point number two, typically do your master's, that's what they would normally do, and at the end of that, the expectation is you're going to be a doctor. So his, his, his parents wanted him to be a doctor. And he came over to the UK, they came over to the UK, lived over here, um, his, his mother was a businessman, his dad, his father was like a professor in a university, and he said, I don't want to be a doctor, I want to do something else instead. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And so he says, well, I want to do, uh, he's like into IT and coding and electronics and all that sort of stuff. So he went down that route. And he said, so it comes to him now, and he's talking to his kids. And in his head, he's got this, you know, well, I've got to hide back my kids. You know, it's my kid turn to talk to my kids. And so he's, one son says, I want to do X, and, and everyone's all right. But at the same time, there was lots of other people from, uh, from friends over from Nigeria. So the expectation, again, is they're going to be doctors, they're going to be lawyers, they're going to be this, they're going to be that. And his son says, and so one of them says to his son, what do you want to be? And he says, oh, I want to do creative studies and something else. And he said, the room just went flat. Because everyone's thinking, that's not a doctor, that's not a lawyer. And now he said he had to fight that thing as well. He wanted his son to be the doctor and be the lawyer. So he said, you can do whatever you want, son. That's what he said to his son. He says, however, you will have lots of spare time in this course that you're going to do. And in that spare time, I want you to work. That's the deal. And so his son said, okay. So now his son is doing his university degree. And he's got lots of spare time. And in that spare time, he's got a job and he works because he wants to build faithfulness. He wants to build that character into his life. And we said the same to our kids. In fact, we laugh now. One of my, uh, Kieran, one of my kids uh, said, uh, we, he, uh, you know, I said, if you want, a, if you want the latest phone, son, you're going to have to get a job. All right, I'm not, I'm not paying. So uh, he got a job as a paper boy, okay? Noble profession. Any pa I'm a former paper. Anyone do the old paper boy routine? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Noble profession, okay? When we looked at his hourly rates after he'd been out and delivered this paper round, it was something like two pound an hour, you know, and we laughed about it. You know, he used to get up at all hours. You get out there, whatever the weather, and deliver. At Christmas time, it was good because you got tips. And people, and we were laughing about the, the rate of pay, and I said, son, it's getting up in the morning that counts. There's a character. That's what, that was the issue. Get up, get out, do the job, and get back, and then go to school. Boom, character building. I know you didn't get a lot of money, but it'll stand you in good stead later on. And now he's, he's wadded, and he's off to do all sorts of stuff with his career. Faithfulness. Recognize what God's given you to do. Get on with it and do it to the best of your ability. Don't neglect the small things. Sometimes little things can be things that you are, you know, why do I have to do this? Don't neglect those. Those little things, particularly in God's economy, end up being big things. But don't neglect the little things. Set your relationship priorities straight. Jesus is first. Um, Imi, who sometimes comes to our church on a Sunday, printed me a hooded top. It's got Jesus first on it, okay? 
Now, the beauty of that is when I put that hooded top on, I forget as I'm walking around that it's got Jesus first on it. So people interrupt you with conversations. I was in B&M Bargains, and someone... In What's that on your front of your shirt for? It says, because Jesus needs to be first. I agree, said this lady behind the till. And we start having a chat. It's great. It's like you don't have to evangelize. You just, people just read your, t- your top and start talking to you. It's fantastic. Put Jesus first, regardless of cost. Now, as you look at this list, it's not just a boring ancestry genealogy. What it is, is a link to the past, okay? History is a sal- uh, sorry, it's from a historical salvation perspective, this genealogy was important because it bridged a period in the Jewish history that allowed Jesus to prove his lineage. Jesus, when he came, was descended from the tribe of Judah, and the lineage of David. And one of the ways that we can trace that through, and that to be true, is through these names that are written down here. Christianity is a historical religion. In fact, this church has roots that go way back to the Puritans and the Duckingfield family. God revealed himself to his people, and this story, this list of people, It's a story of people who lived in history at their particular time and did what God wanted them to do at that moment. What did God want them to do? He wanted them to leave Babylon, where it was cushy and cozy and nice and wealthy and prosperous, and come to Jerusalem, where they had to start all over again, where it wasn't comfy, where it was a little bit uncomfortable. God sometimes does that puts you in uncomfortable places so that it can work things out in you. These people that traveled from Susa in, in Babylon to start again in Jerusalem, they had a tough time. They could have stayed. Their families had been there for several generations, and yet they didn't. They decided to step out and take a risk and do something for God. Why did they do that? They were motivated by a vision. They had a vision that was bigger than themselves. They wanted to see God do something. Ask me, I want to see God do something. I want to see God impact not only this town, but the city. On Wednesday, I was in a meeting with a load of pastors, and the guy that took the meeting, they're not from congregational churches, they're all actually Pentecostals. So I stuck out like a sore thumb because I'm like not my church isn't got like a fancy name like all theirs. But I'm like I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered. I just want to learn. So this guy who's leading this 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 talk, his church is something like about two thousand people packed in on a Sunday. And he gives this story. He says when he took over the church, it was sixteen people. And I'm like. Right, you've got my attention, mate. How did that happen? How did how do we get from sixteen to two thousand? Tell me. Tell me what there is. I'm just like, let me learn. And he said, at the end of the, the of his little talk, he said, I don't want our church to be the only one this size. I want loads of churches in Manchester to be that size. And I'm like, Gah. I was like brave heart and everything, you know what I mean? All I needed was a stripe across my face and a sword. I'm like, because that's what I want. So I'm, everything he says, I'm, I'm hanging on his words. How did you get from 16 to 2,000? Tell me, please. God wants his work to be fruitful. He wants you to be fruitful, me to be fruitful. He says it in John's Gospel. I have come that you might bear much fruit. Do we still believe it, though? That's, that's, a, that's a toughie. Hanging on to that faith that says, you know what, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. Now, the people were motivated by a vision. They knew what they lived for. God had promised to their forefather, Abraham, um, 
to give them this land and to make them as numerous as the stars in the sky. They were well below 50,000 people when they moved in. They were a small bunch of people, but these faithful Jews had their names written down for all eternity. That's why they're in the book. So that you look at them and go, you know what? I've never met Elam of Path Moab through the line of Joshua and Job, or Zatu, or Zakei, or Binui, or Bebabi, or Asgad. And I probably never will meet them. But what I know about them is that they were obedient to what God asked them to do, and in their obedience, it goes through the generations. What they did thousands of years ago allowed Jesus to directly prove his lineage. What we do now echoes in eternity. What's that film? Gladiator. Went to see it on Friday. Not as good as the original, but it's not bad. What we do now echoes through the ages. The choices we make now, what we believe now. Their faith carried through the generations and through the nations to us here and now. Who knows what history will record about us and what we get up to? You know, when we go out, when we all go out as a choir and sing or try and sing or just pretend to sing and just play the music really loud. We might even just have to do that. But whatever we do, who knows what God will do? Now, last point, then we're done. This list here is proof that God knows every name. God knows our names. He knows who we are, what we do, what we can do, what he wants us to do. He knows us individually. He knows us corporately. But he knows us. And the reason that these names are listed is because there is another list that is going to come. There is another list of names that is massively more important than this list. It's the name and the list of the human race. And we're given an understanding of what that list will look like in the book of Revelation, where it says this, speaking of heaven, nothing impure will ever enter it until nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What Nehemiah's doing is he's foreshadowing what is to come. In other words, he's doing a reckoning of all the people and all of numbers and everything, and he's adding all them up because at the end of time, God will do the same. There'll be an accounting in that heavenly city, in that new Jerusalem, and names will be called out, like a roll call. And all those that have gone before us, all those that have signed the seats of this church before us, names that you know and I don't know, people that you know and that I don't know, those whose faith went before us, we now build upon. Their names will be read out. Their contribution will be recognized because they matter. That's why we believe all people matter to God. God took note of their labors. He takes note of yours. He takes note of mine. We believe all people matter to God in the hope that loved ones who are not sat next to us yet will be named in that book. Families are important. This list contains families. It says so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. God's design for the family as a basic unit is the best design. Men and women together, united in a covenant. This family, sorry, the family is also the building block of the church. And that's something we're praying about, something we need to do something about. Nehemiah says that God put in his heart to assemble the people to be enrolled by genealogies. Then he found the book of the record of those who first came up to Jerusalem and it served as a map for this current enrollment. It's important to realize that God put you here at this point in history 
um, to fulfill what he's called you and ordained you to do. Previous generations have passed the torch on. We now have to carry that on. And it's not easy. It's not easy. But by faith, God will intervene. So finally, each of us is unique. God has assigned each of us a different role to fulfill. In Nehemiah 7, some were priests and others were gatekeepers and some were singers and some were temple servants, but each role was equally important to God. Discover who you are in Christ and commit yourself to be all that God wants you to be, where he's put you. There's a famous missionary called Jim Elliot, and at 28 years old, he ended up giving his life for the gospel. And he wrote in his diary, Whatever you, sorry, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. So, people matter to God. Because one, God created them. Two, God called them. And three, he's given them a purpose. Commit yourself to the things that matter. And that's how you make your life matter and prove that all lives matter to him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we come before your throne of grace, Lord, and just rejoice in the fact that you've called us and purposed us and you've got a plan. And there are so many different elements to that, Father. But as we look forward, when we say by faith what we do now, the activities that we do, the interactions that we have, the prayers that we pray, those families that we want to see saved, Father. By faith, Lord, we stand in the gap and say we will continue on with your good purposes. Because like we said in our statement, our vision statement, all people matter to God. Father, we thank you for this great blessing of the work that is before us. And I pray for us to have the energy and the vim and the vigor and the vision to pursue all that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.